Thank you, thank you, and uh, welcome everybody. It's great to have you here. I would say this early in the morning, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, if there are any questions uh, that, that at least you're willing to uh, ask while being recorded, don't hesitate too much. Uh, and uh, I'm happy uh, uh, to have you all here. Uh, again, don't hesitate to ask any questions. We have plenty of time. We have plenty of flexibility in the topics we can cover. And uh, um, yeah, let's get started. So um, what are we going to talk about? Well, the talk uh, I was asked to give is about uh, Badalog and its extensions and business applications. So, well, one thing, and you see here these large overview graphics, don't worry, you don't have to, 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 to remember it now directly, but we are going to talk about Badalog, a knowledge graph management system at its core a lot of extensions and a number of business applications. So we could talk about each of those for hours. Don't worry, I won't bore you to death with that. We are going to uh, choose some of them. And uh, this is quite a modular talk. So if there are some particular items that you personally are really interested in, feel free to post them in the chat box. Uh, I will try my best to actually include them if, if it makes sense time-wise. Otherwise, I will, would uh, give additional pointers afterwards. So if you say, well, there's one of the things that I'm particularly interested in, do uh, give some feedback on it uh, because there's some chance that we can include it. Um, okay, so um, as Joao said, uh, this is a long-standing line of uh, research having originated in Oxford going. And if you look, I mean, the, the goal here is not to bore you to death with paper uh, titles, but uh, uh, seeing that the title of this talk is Extensions and Business Applications, it's interesting to see that uh, as any of these large research projects, you have systems, you have uh, the logical foundations of these systems and so on. But one, one thing you see is a lot of extensions popping up over the years. Enterprise AI, space efficiency, recommender systems applications, money laundering applications, or actually anti-money laundering applications, because it's not that we'd want to do money laundering, we want to detect money laundering. And uh, uh, things like uh, uh, COVID responses, extensions like knowledge graph embeddings uh, for the systems, uh, probabilistic reasoning, temporal reasoning, uh, industrial blockchain applications, and so on. So again, this here is not well now to bore you uh, with, with papers. Don't worry, we are not going to uh, do a super paper focused. Uh, uh, here you get my talk about paper X type style of uh, uh, lecture. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, we are going to keep it re hopefully rather relaxed. So let me actually get to the second module, so to say, of this. As I said, feel free to say anything. This is quite modular. Uh, I can shift things in and out. Um, the first thing I want to say uh, is a bit about people and groups because one of the interesting things here you may have asked yourself now this talk is called Vadalog, or the system and the language and so on. But where does this come from? This seems a rather uh, strange name. So you heard in the introduction already the, the uh, affiliations and background and the knowledge graph lab. Um, uh, the other thing that uh, we have at TOV so, uh, is the uh, Center for AI and ML, which is an interfaculty um, interfaculty research center on AI and ML, led by uh, uh, Stefan Wolfram and Clemens Heitzinger uh, from the Faculty of Computer Science, respectively Faculty of Mathematics and Geoinformation. And now we are getting closer to the question of uh, where does the VADA in VADA law come from? A lot of what you're going to see is something that is part of a large international collaboration called the Joint Knowledge Graph Labs between uh, uh, originally Oxford and Theovin and uh, with a lot of uh, uh, basically Bank of Italy, Banca d'Italia, so the Central Bank of Italy uh, and the applied research team there being at the center of development. And perhaps now you see why basically foundational research systems and extensions and, and business applications is kind of quite natural in our setting 
because that's every uh, uh, all of the uh, people we have at the core of our lab and uh, that's uh, really something ho hopefully you will see by the end of the next well two something hours two hours uh, net uh, that uh, that uh, we are going to spend here together um now the answer to the question of uh, Vada, which uh, Joao in the introduction actually already slightly hinted at, is uh, the name of uh, the large EPSSC grant uh, led by uh, George Gottlob. Uh, um, uh, and Vada stands for Value Added Data. Now, for those of you who speak different languages, Vada also has some food meaning, so you can get your own, you can choose your own kind of, of explanation for it, but formally it's value added data. And it was one of those large EPSSC program grants. And since then, we have been developing this system uh, in, in all of the institutions you've seen uh, before there. And one interesting thing, and that's already the last slide in this block that I really want to show you, because otherwise you're going to be, um, uh, I'm going to, to, to bore you with uh, context information is this is not just a, a theory and practice, uh, even though the theory, as you will see, is extremely important in it and the system side is extremely important in it. So it's one of those things where without the theory and without the systems, you wouldn't be able to do the uh, to do uh, exactly what we are going to see. And I hope both the theoreticians among you, as well as the more systems oriented people, will have something to take away from this. And uh, yeah, these are some of the, uh, the companies where our system is in use or has been in use and used for things like, uh, yeah, I mean, banking and finance, you've quite seen and we are going to base a lot of the examples on that, uh, but also in manufacturing, logistics and more. So some of them we are going to be able to talk some of them I may have to talk off the record uh, when we at some point uh, uh, stop uh, the recording. I can also talk a bit more more freely about some some of those. Uh, um, uh, but we, we will have applications throughout the the part. So hopefully there's something for everybody in it. Good. So let's get started with getting you motivated, hopefully, because uh, so far you've seen a lot of pictures of people and groups, uh, how to actually motivate you for the topics. And uh, let's get started with that. So I said that Vadalog is a knowledge graph management system. What does that mean and why should anybody care about this? Um, so some of you may have heard about um, the term knowledge graph before. Um, depending on which field you come from, uh, it's, it's either quite natural for you to think about knowledge graphs or it's an interesting way to uh, frame your own research and your own things that you want to do. And I want to give you a bit of motivation why this is especially for our community here quite an interesting way of, of, of making people understand. I mean, we are here in the reasoning web community. Uh, it, it, interesting to understand how reasoning and and uh, uh, and in particular uh, the, the reasoning web community fits into these pictures so i will keep it rather short just to make sure that everybody of us is kind of at the same page don't worry i won't spend hours on talking what knowledge graphs are you're not here for that but uh, let's get into it so I, I think there are three good motivations for us and also for us as a community of using uh, these kinds of reasoning techniques in this field and uh, what's the first motivation? Well, it's pretty much probably the, the worst one, you could say, uh, but at the same time, also the one that, that convinces quite a few people that, well, reasoning and, and knowledge graphs are things that we should care about. Well, it's the technology used by Google and others. So um, if I ask, what is the Faculty of Informatics at Theovin? Well, uh, we get answers. And in particular, we get this box here coming from Google's knowledge graph. Uh, so, well, half of you know that already, at least half of you uh, are aware of that. You probably didn't ask, even if you did that, this question here, is my organization compliant with anti-money laundering policies? Well, I think you will not be super surprised that you don't get any answers from that. I mean, that there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, one of them, and this is about extensions and business applications, money laundering is not necessarily a, 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 
business application or anti-money laundering is not a business application that Google search is particularly tuned about. And this requires a lot of reasoning in the background. So we will see that. I can't do that in the motivation, but if you stick through with me uh, until we actually hit the point where we can see that, this is an application, a business application that actually together with the Central Bank of Italy, uh, we uh, handle based on systems, knowledge graph systems that are heavily based on reasoning and deductive AI and declarative AI. And that's that's something to potentially look ahead here. Um, now, the, the second uh, motivation is actually probably one that a lot of you uh, listening to this are kind of fascinated with, namely, it's a meeting place of databases, data science and AI. And that's kind of where a lot of us are coming from. Basically, many of you, many of us will have background in one or more of these areas. And it's a super nice way to bring together different things. Uh, and uh, many of you will have worked in graph databases, machine learning, reasoners, uh, data science or data wrangling applications. The other project originally started with data wrangling. So this basically getting data from dirty data into, into really nice data that can be used to the 80% of data science. But this is all coming together there and declarative AI and reasoning plays, I would say, a center role in it. And uh, again, I won't bore you uh, uh, to that with a lot of those uh, uh, parts, but it's a in nice intersection between many of the topics that a lot of us are working with. And uh, the thing where uh, the principled research uh, uh, comes in is that many of those applications are often put together ad hoc, uh, not without a lot of uh, scientific insight. And a lot of people uh, that are not coming so much from the scientific space as many of you are, don't don't get the full uh, uh, the, the full impact, both theoretical and practical, that is uh, that is field between expressive power and scalability that we have in our kind of reasoning settings and also machine learning settings. If you are coming from that side of of it, uh, uh, are are having insight. So again, I will not go into a lot of those things. Otherwise, we are going to spend here hours and hours. Uh, but the third thing, and that's where the remembering the name of this talk, uh, business applications, it's simply a skill set to solve fascinating problems. And uh, if you look at this one here, I mean, maybe you're fascinated by it. Maybe you're not so much fascinated by it uh, because it's quite still abstract. But may, let's make it concrete. Um, we had a few years ago, one of the largest money laundering scandals in history it was a 200 billion uh, euro money laundering. And basically, with a relatively modest uh, knowledge graph, but importantly, with a number of rules for reasoning about them, you could actually solve this. Now, you could analyze these questions in a lot of details. It's, the, the short answer is it just took three, or I think it was three rules to completely cover this, uh, this use case, which seemed rather complex. Uh, um, but uh, we are going to go into that later. Another case that we are going to look at later in is a call in 2020, uh, where uh, President uh, uh, van der Leyen uh, uh, put this call to shield strategic companies from hostile takeovers during the crisis, like pharmaceuticals, like medical, like, uh, like uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to mention now some of them that some of you may have at the top of your tongue uh, because, I mean, when somebody listens to this recording, they don't know yet the, the temporal context right now. Um, but uh, the, the, the thing is that a lot of business applications, business problems can be solved by much, many of the technologies that you've been using and a lot of spilled, if, even if you're a pure theoretician, a lot of it is coming exactly from that. And we are going to drill down deeply into that so that both the theoreticians and the practitioners among you have something to take away with. And uh, things like, and we're going a bit more mathematically integrated ownership uh, and, and so on. So we are going to see all of these applications and probably are not too surprised to see that in, there are a lot of knowledge graphs out there. And, and there are a lot of things we can do and we will see throughout this talk. So 
Uh, these are my top three motivating points. I hope one or the other at least made you motivated now to uh, to feel energized for the next uh, uh, bit of time. And uh, and uh, it's it's time really to go into uh, what are we going to do. And also, what are we going to leave out? Because I said, well, I'm not going to be able to cover everything. There are some core things that I have to cover here because, I mean, uh, I have a sp specific topic that uh, I was asked to give, extensions and applications. So I have to uh, go into some of the extensions and applications. But uh, really, if there's something that some of you are really interested in, do say so in chat privately, whatever you want publicly. Um, uh, and I will do my best either to include it or actually come back to you later about it. So let's actually go into that. An important thing, and I mean, most of you coming directly from the reasoning side will have a natural understanding of that. Uh, know that at the base level of a knowledge graph, at the base level of, of declarative AI, uh, the representations play a particular role. So let's try to figure out what that is. So um, let me actually open that one here. So these are the four representations essentially that we are going to be talking about. We are not going to talk too much uh, unless you want to about the knowledge graph embedding in the graph neural network space. Um, we could, but other talks cover that to some extent. But let me actually introduce you to the context of this. So, okay, we have here our our um, uh, use case that we've talked about before and you see the same graph here. So just to give you an, an, an overview of what you're seeing because it's kind of boring in case you don't see the, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, so here we have the bank at the center of it, which was Danske Bank, which 100% owns another bank, which 100% owns another bank that had a lot of transnational clients uh, involved in, involved in non-US uh, dollar transactions and by some international standards uh, and I don't uh, I, I will keep that rather rather high level because uh, this is recorded and we don't want to get sued as uh, the reasoning web uh, summer school on that but uh, there are some regulatory uh, uh, there, there are some regulatory effects of, of seeing this situation and uh, to definitely not to get sued let me bring it back to an anonymous case. So we have Central Bank in a city and some oversight authority and so on, so that we have it 100% uh, uh, taken away from the actual application. So don't sue us <laughs> if you're watching this. Now, um, and, and let's actually abstract it. So what do we have? We have a graph, uh, whether it's a knowledge graph or not yet, uh, that's, that's probably up to discussion. <laughs> Uh, depending on that, but uh, in our community we have, uh, and in different communities, we have a lot of data models for that. I'm not going today to talk about different data models. Actually, we will be quite open. If you're a database person, can a database store a knowledge graph? Yes, fine. Can I store it as an RDF graph? Yes, perfect. Can I store it in Neo4j as a graph database? Perfect as well. Uh, we are going to stay really agnostic and inclusive of the different technologies. And from the when we look a bit into the systems, we will also see how through extensions, this can be done quite easily. And uh, I know a lot of you in the community, also some of those of you who are in audience, work on systems that uh, and, and, and applications that have this kind of flexibility. And I won't mention our names since this is recorded, but everybody, so the good thing is really people here in the community uh, uh, work on that. Now, uh, there are two things that that are important. Uh, I mean, one of the things is, uh, and uh, the, the easiest way to visualize these things is making new connections in a knowledge graph. It's missing some tuples, some triples, some edges, some nodes. Uh, and uh, one of the typical methods that, especially if you wouldn't enter necessarily declarative AI, but uh, uh, say uh, an AI conference that that uh, does this is uh, knowledge graph embeddings, which are these machine learning models that have a huge amount of breadth. There are a lot of these models and they allow you to, well, uh, get new edges, detect new edges there, especially if you don't know what is going on, in, 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 if you don't have a knowledge about what especially a regulation is or what money laundering is or what company control is and so on. 
Now, in a lot of those situations, this is complemented and in some case overridden by logical knowledge in knowledge graphs, which, well, depending on which side of, of, of this you're coming from, I assume many of us, many of you will be more familiar with the logical uh, knowledge in, in knowledge graphs, which is, well, declarative rules and reasoning in, in, uh, in most of this setting. And it, it's a perfect complement for many of those because it's for situations like regulations and, and many of those things where we actually know exactly what's going on uh, and, uh, and we need 100% accuracy. We can't afford a single false result. We can't flag something or we can't blame somebody for money laundering if, uh, if, if, it's, uh, if it's not something that, that is actually covered 100% by regulation. The third one is, of course, graph neural networks, which, depending on how you see it or not, are part of knowledge graph embeddings or not. But I'm not going to go into this discussion. And unless people of some of you raise that you want to cover these topics in far more detail of that, I won't cover that too much. In the same way, I also won't cover probabilistic reasoning too much because we have a lot of had a lot of talks in this in the in the last. Uh, week so uh, I, i'm not going to try to to do too much overlap in it of course if some of you are interested to raise a point i have much 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 more material than i can cover okay so from especially from the foundational side uh, and, and from, also from what we are what we are talking about this this picture is probably all you need now for the uh, more systems oriented people among you, let me start with the second one because we are talking about extensions, right? Let's see how that plays into it. And don't worry, we are going to uh, uh, soon go into these actual applications there uh, and, and, uh, and also in the foundations of it. Uh, I, won't, I won't bore you to that with introductions. Um, but just for, so that the systems people in, in our group here are also uh, on the same page, uh, let's talk about systems here. So this is nice, we have this graph here and well, we are happy, right? We have our representations. The problem though is that how to actually build architectures that make that work. Because for this example graph with what? seven or eight nodes and three or no, less than 10 edges, uh, well, probably anything will go. But uh, if you're looking at the knowledge graph that we talked about before, well, we talked about anti money laundering. What is it? There are millions of companies. If you go to transaction level data, we're talking about 10,000 plus transactions per second in typical, uh, in typical transaction networks. So this will make a huge difference in terms of the extensions that we need from uh, both our languages and systems to make that work. And probably extension is then the wrong word for uh, what we need on the system side, uh, we will need restrictions, otherwise we won't, won't be going to be scaling. So the extension is here, making sure that the reasoning language is properly constrained to make this work. And we are going to talk about all of this. So uh, I hope I don't promise too much if, uh, uh, when I say that both the theoreticians among you as well as the practitioners or the systems people will have something to take away from the talk here. And the, the flip side of this is, of course, scalable reasoning, how to make scalable reasoning work in that. And well, that's why many of you are probably here for. Uh, I probably won't talk too much about knowledge graph creation and evolution there, even though these are, of course, quite important topics. What we are going to spend uh, the latter part of it uh, and also mixed through all of the time is, uh, I mean, I will, uh, the second topic I was asked to give is business applications. So we are going to talk a lot about business applications as well. Uh, of course, we are going to focus a bit more on the on the technical side. But uh, as you already see in this introduction, this is really not a second class citizen, so to say in it. We're really going to try to bring all of these things uh, into life. And uh, I mean, You've seen already uh, in the in this graph before that we started kind of one of our running examples there, and uh, we know of course that the services offered by knowledge graphs and deductive AI systems, declarative AI systems, uh, are quite manifold. Okay, um, let's actually get started with uh, 
with uh, the, the the main part here and the the area that many of you I assume are coming from to correct me in the in the chat if that's something you're uh, you're not coming from but uh, that's logical knowledge in knowledge graphs and that's the foundation on which many of you many of us here are building and um, I, I will skip some of the parts that are really uh, basic and in introducing people to, okay, how does logic play a role in this and these parts? But uh, I have plenty of backup material on that that uh, that we can talk about if you don't like it. So let's get started with logical knowledge in knowledge graphs. And in particular, in some ways, the first preliminary thought you can have in all of this is there are two layers here, right? One is the graph layer and one is the knowledge layer. So the most important first observation to make is, well, logical knowledge and rules in this setting are really a way of expressing the knowledge of the knowledge graph in the same way that graph uh, knowledge graph embeddings and graph neural networks can be used to actually uh, find out latent knowledge, knowledge that we don't know about. For example, if you look at uh, our favorite uh, 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 running example, it would be things like unknown connections between people that we suspect from the data. But uh, here we are going to really concentrate on knowledge that is represented logically. So let me get that point there again. And um, in our case here, one of the most important connections that we I mean, quite trivially, most of you can probably have written that with your background knowledge already on, on in the area. But since some of you may be completely new to the area, let's actually get uh, started from that one here. Namely, okay, this bank owns 100% of this bank. This bank owns 100% of this bank. I probably can say something about there is some degree of control over this of this bank here over that bank. So this glowing yellow edge here of this bank controlling this bank, that's probably something that is domain knowledge in our application. And indeed, in economics and finance, uh, the most simple form of control is also called majority-based control. So those of you from the economics background know there are many, many different, very complex forms of control. Pretty much all of them can, and in our collaboration with the Central Bank of Italy in the Joint Knowledge Graph Labs, we have far more complex definitions there, but it's a good thing to start with. So when does it, uh, let's start with direct control. We will look at indirect control later, but direct control means X controls Y if X directly holds over 50% of Y. So, well, what does that mean if you look in first order logic? And don't worry if you don't know your logic, uh, the, the, there will come slides for you later. So if you own, uh, uh, if X owns of Y amount uh, uh, W and W is greater than 0 0.5, then X controls Y. So, so far, so easy. <laughs> you will notice something here that probably uh, it's not always going to be so easy. Sometimes we will have to sum things aggregate things and so on. So you will see when extensions are needed. But for this simple case, it's just this simple logical formula, which is also called a TGD, a tuple generating dependency. It's also called an, okay, it's an existential rule, but doesn't use existentials yet. Uh, so independently of which area you are coming from, you know those rules quite well. And uh, what you are getting there is basically this situation. If there's 73% ownership, then there is control. So many of you are probably familiar with data log. Uh, data log is at the face of it, and we are going to go into it deeper later, um, and, and simply another syntax for this, uh, what we are talking about here, where you basically have the premise on the right-hand side and the conclusion on the left-hand side. So control X, Y is defined by ownership being greater than 0 0.5. Again, I assume many of you are familiar with it. Uh, if you're actually not familiar with it, how do you understand these kind of things? Um, if you're coming from SQL, uh, this simple statement here is just, well, select X, Y into control from company where W greater than 0 0.5. This formulation, of course, won't bring you too far because many people who are probably uh, quite familiar with SQL, we'll see that uh, selecting into things multiple times doesn't work as well. So 
this will not help in the long run, but it's an easy way to understand what all of this is doing, depending on which community you're coming from, logic, databases and data log, uh, uh, SQL, or actually relational calculus. So uh, if you're coming from a more mathematical background and relational calculus, you can do it. And the, the goal here is not to bore you with different, uh, um, different uh, representations. So those of you who did, ever did a databases course will now be reminded of some of the background here. But if you want to use Cypher for that, or that being said, I mean, that's not meant as a kind of prejudice. We can also do this in Sparkle or any language or any graph uh, query language that you want. It's, it's going to be possible to do it anywhere. So the real answer here is a lot of the uh, rules that we represent and a lot of the reasoning that we do is something that at least at face level we can represent in many of those and should be accessible independently of which community you are coming from. But we are going to see that, well, this will not do it in the long run. And this has a number of theoretical and practical reasons. And that's what we are here for uh, as, a, as a journey together with you. So I think, I mean, hopefully the main message of this came across and I will stop that, uh, that, that first part of it here so that we can dig deeper into some more, some more technical parts. But it doesn't matter which community or which area uh, you are coming from or you like. It's, it's all, it's all this, this great uh, bringing topics together and bringing things together. And that's what we are, uh, that's what we are talking about here. Time to go into actual challenges because so far so good, uh, especially if you're, uh, if you're looking for interesting paper topics and so on. <laughs> so far, you've seen a lot of motivation, hopefully, of uh, writing some papers and how to actually make people kind of uh, excited about declarative AI and, uh, and, and, uh, and reasoning or even machine learning, if, that, if that's your background. Uh, but you haven't seen a lot of, of actual so what are the main challenges in there and well the first two main challenges recursion and creation that's something that some of you will be familiar with i think at least recursion uh, many of you will be familiar with creation and in particular existential rules maybe something that and especially warded existential rules maybe something that not everybody here is uh, familiar with um, and let's get all of us up to speed here so that we can uh, get into that. Uh, and, and that we are, once we go into the, in, uh, all the, deep down the rabbit hole, all of us are on the same page. That's recursion. What does recursion mean in our concrete application setting? That means unlimited graph explorations. Why is that relevant? Well, probably if you hide a money laundering operation between 99 layers of interaction, and you didn't do recursion to reach unlimited uh, depth of the graph in 100 or 101st intermediate company, uh, that it won't be, it won't be a too good situation. So if you look into that, we had a quite direct connection, right? It's just one, two, three hops or five hops, if you wish for between those, but you need to, of course, be able to, uh, to follow such traces in an unlimited way. Uh, because, I mean, it's, it's not going to uh, be enough to say, well, uh, unfortunately, our system could only explore it until depth uh, uh, 100 or even 1000. So uh, if you look at that like that, so, for example, that should be something we handle, that should be something we handle. And even more interesting, and that's uh, even those of you who are familiar with, <laughs> deeply familiar with recursion, and I know a lot of you are deeply familiar with recursion, what do we do with that here? That's actually something that purely that the computers, the pure computer scientists among you, um, the, the answer is not as obvious uh, because this depends on the domain. This depends on how economists define ownership and control. If there's a triangle and that happens, actually, if you look at real world knowledge graphs about the actual companies, these triangles and uh, clusters where uh, things are owned in circles, this is normal, this happens, and we need to be able to take that. 
And one thing that uh, both the, uh, the, the theoreticians and practitioners among you will see here, knife algorithms won't cut it here, because you will run in this, uh, in this circle infinitely if you do a knife algorithm that just explores a, a directed acyclic graph. That's not where we are. This is not a directed acyclic graph. Not at all. It's actually so goes so far that this is almost something for those of you who are familiar with um, um, with with um, uh, with, with uh, page rank algorithms and the matter that need to be used here. So let's actually first get this uh, get the actual form of control here. Done. So direct control is not enough, we need indirect control. And we're also going to need the first extension here already that we have in Vadalog. You didn't have an introduction yet to Vadalog fully, but uh, one of the things we really need uh, in, in, in practical applications and something that is very hard in theory is aggregation. Let's see how this comes from. So, well, X directly holds over 50% of Y. We've all seen that and sounded simple, right? Uh, but the, the harder thing is X controls a set of companies that jointly control Y. So what does that mean? If I own 30% of company uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, through some other company uh, somebody owns, there's another 30% of the company owned. So in total 60%, that should be something that you cover. And we are going to look at an example in a minute uh, but one thing you see here is, well, X controls Y and Y controls Z of W, but we can just say, well, is the W greater than 0 0.5? No, we need to do the sum of all W's that, uh, uh, and then see whether this sum is greater than 0 0.5. And here you see already, both the theoreticians and the practitioners among you see, this is going to get really, uh, I mean, we need to think a bit about that. But the theoreticians, of course, well, we are doing, well, aggregation here. <laughs> Aren't we in undecidable territory yet? For the practitioners among you, we are doing aggregation within recursion. This is not going to be super easy. One thing, and uh, that's the M in the sum, monotonic sum. That's the guarantee that a lot of you who probably, uh, for example, worked, uh, and uh, a lot of people in our community have been foundational in building this, like, um, like uh, Carlos Sagnolo and his group uh, uh, working a number, many years on aggregation in this uh, setting. And recently, uh, uh, Reinhard Pichler, Dan Suchu and others uh, are working on formalization in the, in the POT community on some of those items. So it's really something that a lot of people in our community have spent a lot of time on. And it was, if you see it, I mean, this was also one of the original applications that we had for Vadalog eight or 10 years or whatever many years it was ago. If, if in a setting, in an economical or financial setting, we can do aggregation over graphs, nobody's ever going to use our system in practice in, in these settings. There are other systems that do not target these settings, which are of course also valuable, that don't do it. So don't get me wrong, this is not a required extension, but if we want to target this kind of uh, uh, these kind of applications, we are going to need it. Um, okay. Uh, can we do this very simple case also in relational databases? The answer is yes, we can do that. And we are all, I mean, depending on your background, actually a lot of us are from coming from this area. So uh, we, we are very familiar with databases and we like them. Uh, but it's just a, a, a setting where we know that most relational databases are not optimized for. So this is a very similar problem called people of significant control over DBpedia, which is the largest open data source for company data, where you are not, where you can actually publicly report about it. If you work on the actual uh, 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 proprietary or even uh, uh, confidential knowledge graphs, of course, we can talk about that here. But uh, here you see that uh, for recursion over such settings, well, uh, the typical uh, relational databases probably won't be the best idea for that. Again, we are most of us are actually fans of relational databases or coming from this area. This just means that, well, that's just not a use case, not an application that relational databases are typically designed for. 
Here you see how Neo4j performs in this natively. And again, we are not saying here this is now the ultimate benchmark there. I should just give you a bit of a picture of why people like all of you here in the community uh, have, there's a lot of potential for, for, for doing things because uh, um, this, is, this is our system here, Badalog. You could put any other system for these applications here as well. It should just give you a, a feeling like that uh, there are many use cases where specialized systems coming from the research area uh, and, and really getting into applica operationalized applications are useful and can actually compete with, with, uh, with, with, with commercial, commercial systems in these applications. Okay, the second part that we are go going to talk about here is actually, well, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, object creation. And that's where probably a lot of you who dig, dig, uh, dug a bit deeper in the, in the scientific part of it have maybe some background. Probably some of you have never heard about it, so we need to introduce it. Let's actually look, of our, look at our uh, sample again. We have control now, so all fine. We have another uh, requirement, namely that every bank or intermediate institution needs to have a supervision authority. And say we require that every supervision authority has another supervision authority and so on. You kind of see the, uh, a problem of a rule saying that every entity must have a supervision authority supervising it. Because those of you who know uh, that, uh, that you, uh, that you um, uh, well, you build an infinite chain here, so you can you see the issue of naively executing a rule that says every uh, entity must have a supervision authority and a supervision authority is an entity. This cannot be something we can naively trace. And that's what a lot of the data log plus minus, existential rule, uh, and other areas. So this has many names. Uh, uh, well, uh, this is always a, a diplomatically important part to name all of them, but I, I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that those I don't name now are unimportant. So uh, um, uh, data log plus minus existential rules, data log plus minus, uh, um, uh, description logic rules to a certain extent have uh, description logic axioms have some aspects of that and so on and so forth. So you get it. We have infinity in many of our applications that we need to get hold of. This is actually even hidden in this setting. So at first glance, there's no infinity here. Uh, and uh, the problem though is that we are doing, doing here aggregation within recursion. And now if you think a bit about it, well, if you do aggregation, uh, at some point you've aggregated all of the values that you have in the, in the active domain of your database. If, you're coming from the Airbus community, but simply there are some values and you've aggregated them. Now, if you do aggregation in recursion, in theory, you can aggregate infinitely, no? And that's something one has to actually uh, take control of. And uh, so it, it's it, all of these extensions and the theoreticians among you will understand that quite easily. They, they, they need handling from us. And that's where a lot of us in the community have a lot of interesting theoretical and practical challenges. And that's, that's, that's why this is not just, well, ha ha, we can sum up, uh, but uh, is, it, is it easy? No, it's actually not at all easy. In this case, actually, you could sum up to infinity easily <laughs> if that were possible. Uh, basically, a non, create a non-terminating program easily. Okay, so hopefully you've seen some of the challenges of it there. Now, let's actually get, uh, uh, get into uh, trying to uh, uh, solve them. And we have, well, 25 more minutes until the break, uh, roughly. So feel free to interrupt whenever you have a question. Uh, so let me do a pretty quick primer on recursion. I will keep it rather short because uh, most people of you will be familiar with recursion. Uh, in SQL, I assume, but I do know that this is op uh, sometimes uh, a bit further away. So whenever in one of our, whoops, sorry for that, um, I activated the the uh, subtitle mode, whatever that is. Uh, so um, whenever you see this primer moniker here, you will see a rather short introduction to it. 
mainly not to bore you to death with uh, this shouldn't be a database lecture, but we want to understand how Vatalog works and the extension works. But I know that some of you may not have used recursion in SQL reasonably uh, uh, in, 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 in some reasonable time. So uh, let's give it a quick primer and for those of you who haven't seen it at all. Well, it's a, uh, it's a very fast uh, one. Okay, so let's take this graph here. These are uh, connections between airports and say we have this airport table or uh, uh, graph properties, so node properties, properties of the nodes, airports, namely with, with cities and IATA codes, which are these international air traffic codes. And we have edges from origin to destination with annotation, which airline it is doing. So if you are from the graph area, this is an edge. If you're from the database area, this is a table. Both are tables and one is edge properties and the other node properties. And uh, if you are, I mean, independently of how you want to represent it, you get the deal. Uh, since we are trying to ex understand this with SQL, of course, these are two tables. So um, what if we want to understand uh, uh, the airports and uh, which cities the airports are in? Well, in SQL, you can just say, give me the city selected into the city table from the airports. That's pretty simple. Uh, if you want to now see where you can reach from London, namely to San Francisco and Oakland uh, in our tables. Well, that's going to need a bit more. We are, for this very simple thing, at, le at least need a query in the form, well, select the stuff from the flight table, join the airport table on something. Again, I don't want to bore you to death. Uh, if you're new to SQL, if you're new to it, it's probably fast. If you're used to it, it's probably quite slow. Um, but the key thing starts with where can we go from Vienna? Well, from Vienna, we can go to London and from London, we can go to San Francisco. Uh, we are now only looking at the airport codes to make it simple. So to SFO, we're not going to count Oakland now as part of San Francisco. Those of you who know this, you see already a bit of knowledge used here because, well, Oakland and San Francisco are not that far away from each other, but we are going to keep it simple here. How do you actually ask that as a query in SQL? Well, it's like that. With recursive connections as a base case and an inductive case, select that. And those of you, why are we talking about that? Those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with uh, data log, I assume most, many of you are, but somehow people figured out this is pretty cumbersome to use, especially if you have multiple rules. And if you have, basically, uh, this is fine if you have one rule or one of those inductive definitions, but basically once you have multiple ones, are you going to constantly execute all of these, say you have a hundred rules? That's not a good way to execute rules in the system. So um, second part of the primer, but then we are going to stop with that so that at least those very new to it had some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of, um, yeah, primer to it, uh, people figured out that it's pretty cumbersome to do that and there are easier ways to do that. And what is that? It's the data log language we briefly saw before. And that's what Vatalog is building upon and that's what a lot of our systems and I wouldn't be surprised if a third of you is actually working with this on a daily basis, data log as a language, but I mean, we can't just ignore the other third of it. Don't worry, we are going down the rabbit hole quite deeply, so there will be something even for those of you who so far say, well, I, don't, I do know data log, uh, give me something more, you will get something more. For those of you who are new to data log, well, we have here, if there's a flight from X to Y, there's a connection from X to Y, and now the inductive case, which is quite relevant, if there's a flight from X to Y and a connection from Y, from y to Z, there's also a connection from X to Z. And if it's the first time you're seeing this, probably it kind of makes sense uh, uh, to, to write something like that. So, uh, and it's a bit more, it's both more readable probably than uh, many, uh, many of those recurs recursive SQL uh, definitions and, and uh, it's also going to be that. So just as a, as a full, uh, as a, as a, as the final uh, part of, of of, of a simple part of this introduction, let me go over that. We have in data log things called head and body, 
body is on the right hand side, the head is on the left hand side. This is like an if and then in programming languages or a select on from in databases. And we have tables or relations or edges and also machine learning inclusions. We are maybe going to talk about a bit on the graph neural network and knowledge graph embedding parts of it. Uh, data log can be used for many things, as you all know, after this week with, uh, with a lot of the probabilistic reasoning and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Joao's talk on machine learning and, uh, and explanations and in, in reasoning. Uh, and uh, uh, you all know that these things are quite, quite more than they seem to be. Um, we have tables and variables. For those of you who are used to this, it's variables, but I, I mean, I assume that most of you are up to date with that. If not, uh, you had a, a bit of an introduction into it now. We could, if you we, if we had more time and, and uh, if I didn't know you, probably all of you are quite familiar with that or most of you, I would now spend more time of it. But uh, mainly we want to actually uh, go into, into some examples here and some applications here before we see how to actually solve it. So let's, I mean, this is extensions and applications. Let's actually look into one of those applications that is really driving all of this. That's recursion in the real world. Let's look at what kind of situations we need to handle. Because one thing we like to do as if you're coming from radical space is uh, is probably proving some some uh, f formulations about these uh, and, and uh, complexity guarantees if you're coming from a practical site building systems. But what's our goal? What do we actually want to handle there? And uh, the thing that we want to handle is, of course, situations like that. But that's a pretty simple situation. Let's look at how this really looks like. And this is not, I mean, uh, this is not a full graph here, but it shows you all kinds of situations that happen when we uh, and uh, I see a lot, some of you in the in in the in the uh, among the people who are listening, uh, who are actually working with such situations on a daily basis, and these are your your daily challenges. Working in a knowledge graph, or in particular a graph in this case, uh, because the knowledge comes from our rules on top of it and the machine learning, um, that looks like that. So we have companies owning each other in, in triangles. What does that mean if this company owns 100% of that, owns 100% of that and that one? What do we do with these kinds of situations here and these kind of clusters and strongly connected components and disconnected parts? How, how does that work? And the real answer is funnily, this, is, this goes into, into things like, like, uh, things like um, patron-like uh, algorithms. So it's, it's, it's often not enough to uh, use quite standard uh, ways of, of handling these situations. And we, we, we see this. This is a famous picture uh, called uh, sometimes the Italian lungs, which shows two particular strongly connected components that are heavily connected. This, every node here is a company. Every edge is some ownership. And uh, you see here how connected this goes, and uh, and anybody among you probably has, has knows quite dearly or uh, has at least heard that extremely dense parts of a graph are often a problem for algorithms in this case, both for complexity reasons and for for uh, practical systems performance reasons. And that's what really happens. That's part of the Italian uh, uh, company knowledge graph that is publicly known. So this is a public graphic. I need to. I see. I didn't put the source here, so I will. Uh, I, I will uh, 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 put that uh, uh, on later. But uh, this is real world. That's that's how the real world looks like. This is not fantasy that we are talking about. And this is just basically two big conglomerates in Italy. You can imagine how this looks in the bigger case. And uh, actually, one application that we did, and we are going to talk a bit uh, later on that, is during the first part of the COVID pandemic. I mean, by now. If you're listening to this later on the recording, uh, it's already a few years into it, uh, so it's not anymore that new. But in the beginning, the question was, OK, who is affected? Which companies are affected by some of the degrees? And here we see, I think, companies affected by the 4th of, was it the 4th of April decree in, in, in Italy? So basically, the result of a knowledge graph 
whose application it was to understand the knowledge of what a particular Italian uh, degree of the parliament was to, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, stop the spread of COVID and what effect this has on businesses and companies. And that's what we see here. And that's not trivial knowledge because it contains legal parts. It contains things like ownership and control and who is working where and so on. So you can imagine that uh, that that things like that, this is not fantasy that we are talking about. This is real world, uh, well, not just well, some playing around with some numbers in ownership and control. And you've seen the most simple cases like simple indirect ownership in with loops, but this can actually go much harder. And those of you who are coming more from the theoretical algorithms part will know that, well, this, this requires sometimes sophisticated graph algorithms. So there are a lot of research opportunities in any of that. Will every uh, 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 knowledge graph management system be fast on such situations? No, because this is a particular optimization for many of those situations that some systems may want to do and so some others are not. And this particular one is probably a really, I mean, you can do that if you want to do. Just to give you an, an, a feeling of how some of the ownership look like, uh, I won't go into all of extensions there because otherwise we are going to sit until tomorrow and all of us are becoming economists after that. But um, uh, there are, in ownership there are things called uh, Epsilon Baldone paths and ownership, uh, Baldone ownership is defined based on that. And it's really, you can formulate it in any ways. This is not the end of all things in terms of formulation, but just a way for you to actually see how things go there, including summing up things and then actually building paths. So representing paths explicitly, making sure that paths and nodes are merged, uh, summing things and so on. So the theoretician among you will see here, well, looks quite undecidable already. And in general, yes, using all of these features will make the thing undecidable. And that's why we, of course, need to make quite uh, sure that all of our extensions, uh, like existential rules and so on, are uh, on, on a, a, a sound theoretical basis. And we are going to look into that. And in particular, we will see that the theory here is the reason for the high performance. So that's control. That was ownership and control we've now seen here. So, well, uh, if there are companies that control that have self-control ability to control themselves, so that's the very simple case of it. So those companies that there are some exceptions of companies not controlling themselves, but that's a particular uh, side case that we are not going into. Uh, and uh, the second part you've already seen. And there you see how all of those fits together. And what you've seen here is that uh, I, I will uh, formulate it um, uh, diplomatically. Well, complexity raises quite quickly, quite fast in these cases. And extensions pile up quite quickly, quite fast. One particular thing, and that's another motivating example. I mean, I was asked to give a talk about business applications. So let's try to push that down a bit more so that hopefully we are even more motivated once I go into the theorems later on. And you see how does that actually work? After all of these promises, where is this deep theory that I'm promising you? Uh, but uh, let's actually get the business application part of it uh, down first and a few more examples. What are golden powers? So every nation, every sovereign state usually has something called golden powers allowing you to block any kind of a takeover of a company that is of, of, of supreme interest. So for example, if uh, uh, somebody tries to take over a, um, a company producing essential medical goods and wants to be, transform it into a, I don't know, uh, something factory, uh, Governments have the power to say, no, you're not going to do that uh, because um, maybe after that, our uh, uh, the, the, the worldwide medical infrastructure is probably uh, uh, affected by that. And that's that's independent of the uh, of the companies here. We have it for Itali Italy, but basically this holds for every bigger uh, and uh, but basically every um, uh, country in the world and even some uh, organizations uh, and the bigger uh, unions like, like I mean, the European Union has some certain uh, powers as well individually. So how does this setting look like? 
if there's a set of strategic companies and some other company uh, potentially uh, trying to acquire a number of shares, uh, is that going to cause control over that? Because we want to exert golden power, so the supreme power only if necessary. And there comes the problem. So most of these cases actually don't uh, take, uh, there's not the problem of, uh, of, of using these golden powers, actually not noticing that you, you should use that. And it's necessary now to block a particular transaction because it's going to have some effects later on. So let's look at an example here because text boxes are fine, but uh, well, reading text boxes during a presentation is always super boring. So let's get into an example of that. So we'll see here, well, there's this company one and the strategic company B. So the strategic company is B, the, uh, the, the potential hostile company outside is is one and again this is we are talking here about italy but uh, put any kind of uh, uh, national or even union border there so for example say the uh, european union border and so on you, you translate it into whichever setting you want but uh, you see here that um that any of those here so if c here owns 31 percent and a owns zero to two percent actually well if one takes 90% of C alone, that's still fine because they can't, at least if it's a majority-based control setting, with 31% control, well, uh, ownership, there's not enough that you can do. This doesn't need to be blocked. But once the, uh, once the company one tries to take over 51% of A, which only owns 20%, so 0 0.2, actually, if this is of, vital interest to to basically the health system of a country then there needs to be thought about whether it makes sense to exert golden power to block this transaction and the transaction here would be acquiring 51 percent uh, of a or even the last two percent of a that you're not doing and that's how things happen right say the uh, one owns 49 percent of a and wants to buy two percent Somebody needs to flag that uh, buying these two percent is a bit of a problem, and that's how this goes. So there you see why the things we are talking about here is not just well a, a funny situation, but something that that we can do. And here you see the actual uh, even for this problem of checking golden power, you see that this can be done with four rules there, and you will all get the material later on, so you can think about in more in a more peaceful setting uh, um, uh, how this whole, uh, whole thing goes. So um, sounds good so far. Let's get into the center of the challenges and see the first of the solutions there. And we have a few more minutes before the break. And I think we are going to hit a pretty good uh, uh, point for the break here. Um, let's go into the, uh, you've seen the one challenge, which is recursion, which there are systems that can handle this challenge, but most of the systems and, and many of those things you are developing, uh, many of you are developing in theory and practice have a second challenge and that is creation because without something infinite being created, recursion is actually under control. Now we or you may remember this example I made before on basically every supervisor must have a supervisor and so on. So you get these infinite chains. That's not just uh, that's not just uh, a theory. That's something that happens in a lot of those real applications. I won't put all of them in. There are countless papers that we did for doing that. Let me show you a very simple example of that. It's not going to be now the the super the the super. Um, uh, the uh, sophisticated one because otherwise we are going to uh, bring some of those of you who've seen in this the first time we will immediately make you run away for the second part so those of you who are very familiar with existential quantifiers and object creation bear with me we need to make sure that those uh, who see the first time also get uh, something out of this and that's uh, well uh, uh, yeah creation so what do we see here well, this is a simple setting. Uh, let's let's take a look here. 
Every public limited company in the UK is a company, and in particular, HSBC is the largest UK bank, I think, is, uh, and, and uh, it's a, in particular, it's a public limited company, uh, is a company. That's domain knowledge in some ways. It's very specific domain knowledge. Uh, and in particular, in general, usually many of us who are familiar with rules would formulate it at least like that. Then we're saying that every UK company, UK, uh, um, entity that has the legal form public limited company is considered a company. Well, that's quite trivial knowledge, you may say, uh, but it's something that our system needs to know, and it's probably much better to do it like that. Unfortunately, though, um, and I mean, the, the next thing we can also say is probably every public limited company worldwide is a company, uh, but I don't know whether you uh, thought about the jurisdictions of all of the worlds that uh, com countries in the world there. So maybe that one is the right thing to do. Maybe that one that depends on our domain knowledge. The real thing that we usually have, though, is that the company table will have a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, unknown factors there. And this is the very simple case in which we are missing things in the table. But in many cases, what we're actually talking about here is creating objects, nodes, edges in a knowledge graph that we don't know about yet, but we want to reason about. So existential quantification is super powerful in such settings, super dangerous, of course. And we need to make sure that we can handle things like, well, in the database area, at least saying, well, I don't uh, I have a company, but I don't know the location. So every public limited company is a company and the company table contains location, but I don't know it. That's quite natural to express. And uh, well, all of these can be seen for the logicians among you as quantifier block uh, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, implication. And I won't go too much into TGDs and EGDs here, even though uh, we could go into it because it's a nice connection, but I'm going to not do that here. Otherwise you're, get, you're getting uh, bored. Um, and we know these have a lot of names, name queries, logical formula, constraints, ruled on logical axioms, dependencies, depending on which site, which subfield, so to say, of our uh, reasoning web rule, uh, rule, uh, rule ML declarative AI site you are coming. Well, rule is probably a good uh, uh, common denominator. And uh, the thing, you can create things in databases in a certain way. I mean, you can create sequences, but that, in many cases won't solve the problem. And well, you all know from databases that there are, there's a solution called nulls from there, depending on which, which, which exact field you are there, you will know them under different names, uh, often labeled nulls. And from SQL, you may remember this uh, super interesting truth table of SQL with uh, three truth, three truth le uh, levels, including null. Um, we are not going to do a super deep discussion about nulls here, but we are going to see, and I will tease that before going into the break, then we are going into the break, uh, that nulls are going to be somewhat of a, of, of a thing we need to take care of. And we are just about to go into the break. Let me tease you what you can expect after the break. First of all, what we are going to start with after the break, and that was kind of also my time plan, that we are digging into both the theorems and the system level algorithms and design uh, about, uh, about, uh, um, uh, about all of this. So just as a teaser, um, the, yeah, as a teaser, the, um, entire thing that we looked at here, which is called data log with existentials is undecidable. And a lot of our community has spent a lot of time of finding decidable fragments. Uh, I'm deliberately saying this because this specific graphic doesn't show the important language of shy, which uh, a lot of the teams in Calabria have spent quite a lot of time in working with. And we recently also uh, uh, found ways of bringing shy and warded data log together. I'm just saying that because uh, I, I still need to find a way to update this graphic in a 
in a reasonable way there. But uh, Shy is also an important language in there, and there are a lot of connections in there. You see our community work quite a bit on that, and you see the theoreticians among you will see a lot of complexity classes and hopefully be excited for after after the uh, lunch time. Um, where you can see, where we will dig deep into all of this, not all of that because we just have one hour, but a bit deeper into that. And the practitioners among you will see how to actually make a system work that can do a lot of those things that we are doing there. So just to show you a teaser picture of that. So hopefully the 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 the, the theoreticians among you will be teased enough to understand how, okay, how does that actually work? What's behind that? And for let me show you a teaser for the practitioner among you. Um, and I will show you that image there, and then we are going to go into the break. For the practitioners, the teaser is, okay, how do we do a system that can do all of those things? What's going to be the architecture, but mostly how is it going to look in, inside? How, and, and some of you will be surprised that Vadalog looks like a database inside, a database management system. And that's quite surprising if you are if you are used to this area. And we are going to look into a lot of these things. So hopefully also the practical people among you have now a bit of a of a uh, excitement to go for afterward. We are not going to cover everything, don't worry. I'm not going to uh, uh, basically uh, uh, do a fast forward. We are going to give some theoretical depth after the break and some practical depths of it. And with that, I want to let you uh, punk almost punctually into the coffee break. Uh, and uh, we are going to reconvene, uh, if I remember correctly, and maybe some of the organizers can uh, veto if that's not correct, in at 45, uh, independently of your time zones, in roughly 30 minutes at 45 minutes past the hour, we are going to reconvene here. And uh, and uh, in the meantime, feel free to uh, drop any questions. Uh, we are going to stop recording now, I assume, in the break. So uh, feel free to ask any questions. Feel free to also put them into chat. We have some flexibility after the break. Tell me what you are interested in, and we can make sure that I also uh, put it inside. So uh, that everything goes in the break where you're not recorded. <laughs> And uh, yeah, see you after the break. And there's also a link I think you can follow during the break uh, uh, for the for the uh, interact interaction and chatting during that. So thanks everybody, and hopefully uh, uh, you are teased enough to have something interesting after the break. See you soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you. And let me. Now go to that one here. Ah, I need to do something here. You should, you, you are not sharing yet. You just need to yeah, share. Yeah, it's share working on it. Some other, the pause function did some strange uh, item. So it's currently marked as sharing, but not sharing. So uh, let me get that uh, running. Uh, so somebody will have to cut something from the recording. <laughs> Good. Um, we will have that running in a in a minute. Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are going to continue soonishly with uh, with what I promised before the break, namely uh, namely. Uh, the system and how it works. But actually, there was an interesting question, or you could say request in the break for uh, for a particular topic that I think many of you will be interested in. So let me at least tease it now, and then we can go into the material. And the question was, okay, so we are in this kind of neurosymbolic setting where we have well, in this uh, battle log system, knowledge graph, and so on. We have logical rules, but we have also machine learned uh, items there. And the question that was asked is how to actually make sure that, uh, how do we handle differences between what is coming from the machine learning part, what is coming from the logical part, and so on. So since many of you are actually probably interested in the research side of it, let me actually start with one area that we are currently putting quite some focus on, that is 
a, a particular way of making sure that machine learning interacts reason so machine learned uh, completion interacts well with logic based reasoning uh, and then I will go to the more classical ones but uh, that is a, a very interesting new area that we have quite a number of us working on currently it's about injecting knowledge into machine learning so basically having data log rules or data log rules or any of the rules we are studying here to inject them into machine learning models. Let's actually quickly see what that means. Uh, I mean, you all know the advantages of different kinds of sites and we could discuss on any of them for any kind of duration. Uh, and this is not meant as a, uh, uh, meant as a kind of authoritative uh, way for doing that. We know that there are advantages and disadvantages of each of them. And one particularly interesting way of, of basically making sure we see that machine learning models take into account logic-based rules quite intensely in, in the setting that we saw before is actually using, uh, using logical rules and injecting them into models. So what is state of the art or what is things that currently systems can do in this case, it's mostly particular types of rules. So for example, here you see rules like, I mean, this is a dual edge rule uh, and uh, um, let me get the pointer. So uh, the, for example, settling off and uh, sibling off is, is, is symmetric or parent off is the inverse of child. And so these typical ontological constraints that we have, these, there are some embeddings that are able to uh, to recognize them and basically then do this kind of uh, uh, the question was about how to basically deal with inconsistencies and and and, uh, and overrides and so on in this case and uh, uh, models are tuned so that to take this uh, into account now there's of course no guarantee for that and that's where the other part of it will come in that we are going to talk after that but it's basically it's it's nice if you've never heard about that before and i know some of you may have heard probably many didn't hear about it there are models that can do that and uh, if you like i can give you pointers on it for example there's a system called express if e all of these embedding models have the e in the end express fe that uh, currently i think we we put on archive already a version of it but there are also others out there that you can find pointers on that so if you're interested uh, I will uh, I will put uh, put some pointers on that. Uh, the the model that we are working on is called Expressive E. Um, uh, what's the main thing there? Uh, uh, so basically, well, uh, the system hopefully the machine learning system by injecting these logical rules will have a higher likelihood of producing and following these logical rules. So some have to a certain statistical uh, um, point of view guarantees. And uh, well, some of you in the audience, let me look whether somebody who is currently in there is even an expert on this topic. Uh, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. At least I, at first glance, I don't see it. But uh, basically, uh, this is an interesting topic. Um, and how can we do that in general? And then I will, I mean, the thing here is I also want to leave time for your question in the end. So probably I can't go deep into all of the topics, but uh, we can do that by data augmentation. So basically uh, first using the logical rules, then putting it into a machine learning model. This is of course possible, but computationally expensive. We sometimes do it, but often it's computationally prohibitive or parameter constraints like parameter, so-called parameter tying. And we will see an example of that possibly. Uh, and uh, and design choices like defining an architecture based on logical rules, meta path past architectures. So probably, if we wanted to talk about that, we could do a full week course only on this topic. Super fascinating uh, and and a lot of interesting work going on there. Uh, and uh, we are going to touch a bit of the surface on it and see see uh, what can be done. Um, uh, what what particular models there are? I mean, I mentioned uh, one of ours. There's simply and simply plus, 
which uh, uh, put constraints on parameters there to inject knowledge. So all of these machine learning models have parameters and you can constrain them to inject uh, a thing, uh, in, inject knowledge and there are other ways. So uh, yeah, uh, we, uh, it, it, for the most interest in among you, we can put additional material there as well. We could be talking for hours only on the topic, obviously of, of, of the current research on the express CV model, which has, has many connections to Waterlog, but of course it's not directly now the, the core of this talk. Let me go to something almost obvious, but uh, that's the second part of it. Namely, there we have it. No, that's the wrong one. Let me open it. Injection grant challenges very many windows open right now and that's yeah perfect yeah, i have my slide deck modular slides have disadvantages and advantages the advantage is that you see a lot of things and the disadvantage is that uh, to bring them up so uh, this is an impromptu answer also to the other question so uh, this is all nice all of these models that they can inject knowledge but it is also be possible to handle that from the other side. And the answer is yes, though, uh, I mean, in some ways, the other direction is not surprising. And of course, there's a lot of research currently going on into how to make these things a bit more, uh, a bit more uh, interactive and half of our community is working it. Half of the talks of this summer school are on it. Um, the first one is, of course, the, the simple interaction model that, uh, that, that is supported by the Vatalog system, uh, of course, to prepare relations as ML input and use the machine learning uh, uh, as part of the reasoning system than as the output. That's more of a, you could call it more of an engineering challenge than a, than a, than a scientific challenge because it's just making sure that this is frictionless. Um, and the second one is using basically machine learning packages and, and systems as special predicates really inherently called by the core of the system. And the third one, and I know actually one of you in the audience is uh, working uh, uh, on it quite intently. Uh, and uh, by the way, congratulations on uh, finishing your PhD on the topic. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Oxford Diffel on the topic. Uh, Leanne Long, who is uh, currently uh, in the audience, is actually uh, has been working purely on this model three during his uh, during his Diffel or PhD, namely machine le learning rule rule learning and making that interaction of rules basically happen at the side of the reasoning system. So basically, uh, uh, through rule learning getting additional rules into the system and making sure that we can control the interaction between uh, uh, between the rules and, and others at that level. So all of these are possible. We could talk a full week about them. It would be super fascinating. Um, but to just give you a glimpse of a very simple model that's not any of the sophisticated ones, uh, uh, that uh, you can also find more details on that in the in the paper, by the way. So. This is maybe a pointer to say, well, there's pretty long material available to accompany this. And it's basically, well, how do you do this? If you just want to do it simply in the system, well, uh, we have a knowledge graph embedding model here that is uh, bound by a tensor flow uh, in, uh, in, in some particular, uh, in, in some particular er area there. And uh, how to, can we give it a training set? Well, yeah, let's just, transfer some of our ownership edges here and some not ownership edges into a training set for that. And it, again, this is not surprising. This is the simple mode of interaction that we can explain here in a few slides in particular two. And then we can uh, fit a knowledge graph embedding model on it uh, and simply predict some uh, ownership edges, put some threshold on, 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 uh, on the degree of confidence that the model has and get them out again. So this is not, this is technical. There's no, this, this simple mode is quite, uh, you could say uh, one of the most simple ones of them, but it's very easy to see. And it's sometimes very nice to have something 
like for example see a user who does this in say you have a Jupyter notebook and use uh, data log and and uh, data log and and uh, declarative AI and just making this as a like by the way let's simply train this knowledge graph embedding model let's get the results in the same way importing learned rules and if you want to be fancy of course going into injecting knowledge into your KGE models everything of these is a sane model of doing that and we are especially currently so the two main areas of research we are focusing on is injecting knowledge into uh, models and uh, and as a second one where where basically we had a we had a, 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 one of the lab graduating recently is uh, is is a learning uh, is on the rule learning side that is also fascinating but that would be the far the the, um, uh, the 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 good answer in that and those of you who are working on traditional who are coming from traditional a data quality data integration setting think about it once you have things under your control in a system a lot of the traditional uh, data integration data quality uh, uh, methods that you have in your repertoire again usable so it's it's certain and it, the good thing it's an area that is not fully solved a lot of us are working on it in this area at the moment and some things are solved but surely not all of them so that was my quick excursion into data log and machine learning, data log and knowledge injection in these models. Obviously, I could only scratch the surface there, but hopefully it teased a bit of interest in there. And keep it coming. If you have such questions and, and uh, topic requests, do tell me. The most boring of, of such a lecture is actually when uh, 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 when uh, when we uh, when we when we have just me talking for hours and hours about something and you not gaining a lot of information through that so uh, keep that coming and also say if you want more of that because i have potential to to actually go uh, longer into into this part of it now back to the back to what I promised you before the break. And that's of course, well, let's now get into, uh, into, uh, in, into the battle log system. Let's open that. Maybe I will go directly. Ah, let me, let me tease you, get you a bit back into the mode so that we know where we are. Uh, so, what do we even require from knowledge graph management systems? Just quickly to bring us in the right mindset of, uh, after our brief excursion. Well, we know all of us are from different areas in some ways. So, some of us are probably really seeing this from the side of the representation tools, the models, the, this is the language, this is the, this is the embedding model, this is the graph neural network. Uh, some of us are more from the management perspective and some of us see it more from the application perspective. So it's clear that we need somehow some kind of definition of it and one that we usually uh, put as somehow a working definition for that is enterprise knowledge graphs must be defined in a knowledge graph management system that allows you to provide a language and formalism for representation and reasoning. That's where basically our declarative AI rule based reasoning heritage is coming from in some ways uh, can access a rich set of data sources can embed third-party procedure and code and provides APIs. So it kind of looks like that. And that's the kind of system we are going to talk about right now. Uh, and I'm not going into many of those details. Otherwise, you are going to get, again, bored to it. Let's actually go into, uh, in, into, the, into what we want to do there. And what are we going to, in particular, do here when we are. We have just two hours or so in total, so uh, not any more two hours, obviously. But uh, we are going to scratch at least enough surface that you hopefully get interested and dig deeper in the areas that you want. So if you want, that's our, uh, that's the, what we call sometimes the Vadalog flower, which is in some ways the outside view of it. I mean, all of you know, recognize the buzzwords that are on the outside of it. But the really interesting thing for, you, for us here is to see how it looks inside and for that we need to first understand what kind of reasoning we want so for two things we have already seen we need recursion 
and in particular full recursion, any data log recursion should be executable, no compromise. There should never be a situation where we can have data log recursion and not execute that. We want all ontological reasoning, including object creation. But one thing we've already seen is numerical reasoning, including aggregation. And what we haven't seen, and what I probably will keep in the background this, for this one, because you've seen it so much this week already, is probabilistic reasoning. We could talk three hours only about probabilistic extensions. This is not the right place for it, especially since I think you've seen quite a lot of it. I can give you pointers if you're interested in the probabilistic extensions there. Um, what we've uh, yeah, did a bit of a dive here is the sub-symbolic reasoning that we need these days, that's essential. And you've seen it in the beginning when I talked a lot about knowledge graph embeddings and graph neural networks. You've seen me tease it here a bit. That's one of the extensions that, of course, really important for us at this point. And for things like injecting knowledge, interacting normally with uh, between machine learning and reasoning within the normal system side that you have seen and l uh, working with learned rules. There's quite a broad package of working with sub-symbolic, uh, but this is one of the grand challenges, of course, in our field. And we are going to, we, we have talked a bit about it. If you have time and, and, and questions on it, we can also chat a bit about it in the end. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the last thing there, and let's see whether I actually have time to cover it. If not, that's not a big deal. I think doing this, doing this, uh, this deep uh, dives into many of those things that we did is uh, of course worthwhile. I will try to save some space for giving you at least a teaser on temporal reasoning because that's another extension that we are focusing quite a bit time on. And the most important one, and it's, you could call it an extension, but it's actually a requirement or philosophy that we are usually using is basically stay, stay scalable, stay tractable, stay even in, in, in uh, complexity classes that can be parallelized uh, or theoretically parallelized most of the time. So make sure that the language itself stays in most parts as P time tractable as possible, and even in some ca uh, cases goes to uh, to, to uh, theoretically parallelizable, and as we will see, also practical uh, parallelizable uh, uh, settings. Again, we can cover everything. Let me just drive one message home here, uh, and uh, then you can get more background in that if you really like in papers. But the Vadalog system, well, has support in many of those cases, but the core language of Vadalog called Water Data Log Plus Minus actually covers these three ones. Polynomial time with subfragments that are fully parallelizable, expressive power of Sparkle and R2QL, and full support for recursive data log. And um, how this is done? Let's look into that. And if you go into it first, the first surprising thing maybe to many of you will be, well, most reasoners out there actually cannot uh, build from, from, from basically from first print, uh, not from necessarily from first principle, but like a database management system. Uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, and uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. So architectures always have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but there's a, a really good reason for our particular uh, uh, architecture and use cases to go for that way. It's not always the right choice, but for our cases where we really want this database-like performance for many of the applications, uh, it, it really, uh, it really uh, uh, worked well. Of the, because of the execution planning and optimization. But in particular, since we could use a very streaming base, so for those of you in the database area and the volcano iterator model, uh, it's, it's, it's not stream processing in the sense of stream reasoning that some of you may be uh, uh, well uh, familiar with, but it's, uh, it's actually, it's actually um, uh, stream processing in the sense of 
in the sense of the volcano iterator like models of course compiled down in many cases parallelized done in many different ways but taking it at the base of it for those of you who are familiar with regular normal uh, database management systems uh, these always are based in this kind of streaming architecture where you have input scans output scans and intermediate nodes between them and the thing that makes of course ev that changes everything is the recursion because we all know these models usually don't work in the presence of recursion. And what happens if you have recursion? Well, what ha the, the thing that happens is that you really need to take extreme care of caching because tuples will go through the system in many, many different ways. And you really need a sophisticated cache hierarchy. So for those of you who are, who, who are really interested in that, uh, look into our VLDB paper. Basically, most of our joints that are actually funnily have many of, we have many different joints, but uh, what these caches lead to is that nested loop joints actually behave almost like hash joints, which is really fascinating to look at. Well, some of you will get fascinated, the rest of you will now start uh, 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 running away in panic. Oh my goodness, they are talking joint techniques. Um, I will not go too deep into that, of course. I will stop actually here about talking about that because uh, really a lot of the, the, the key ways of implementing this is via cache indices and where's the secret sauce that's in the termination strategies. Because I told you, well, if we have all of this, we can get non-termination and the real secret sauce, so to say, I mean, it's not secret, you can read it in papers. Uh, uh, and it's, it's just very hard to implement it in practice, it's, uh, it's termination strategies and making sure that we have a lot of different termination strategies that are very adapted to guaranteeing termination while optimizing the, the best performance we can get in a database-like way. So making sure we get this database-like performance without compromising, of course, termination because we can't. <laughs> We, we can't uh, 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 get a single, uh, I mean, it must be 100% guaranteeing termination, obviously, otherwise it's not complete. So that's the thing, optimizing as far as it goes without that, and that's how it goes. And I will show you uh, in the next case, in the next uh, example, how this works. And I'm not going to go into uh, into benchmarks because this shouldn't be a, this is a school, this is not, we are not, uh, the main uh, uh, message of that is, is actually making sure our rule-based reasoning systems and reasoners are, are, are interesting to the outside. It's not benchmarking and so on. Of course, you know, all of the conferences, obviously we need to do benchmarks against everyone to for a conference to take it seriously. But uh, I think the message inside of our community is clearly, we need to make sure that, uh, that, this, that, is, that people understand what uh, our kind of system can do, including in the machine learning world that we've seen there. But I promised you some theorems, the theoreticians among you, the theoretically minded, and you're going to get them. So obviously I have to uh, give you a bit of meat in this presentation so that not afterwards you say, well, that was a nice introduction, so let me read now the papers, uh, which of course, if you want to go to details, you need to do, but uh, give you a bit of more. So uh, this is a bit more uh, advanced for those of you who have never seen it before. Uh, um, if you want to really understand everything, then read. of course you need to read the paper. So let's actually look both inside of the system and into the theoretical structures that we are building uh, in theory. And this is actually an interesting message to both the theoreticians and the practitioners among you out there. So Vadalog is a, is a, a, probably there are many systems out there where you take the theoretical, uh, the, basically the originally the proof of the P time completeness of, of, uh, of Vadalog, of what a data log, and uh, I will uh, introduce the language to you, no worries about that uh, uh, later. Mm. Or actually, let's do it now that we, that you have the, let's, let's do it now so that you actually have a bit of the, uh, of the uh, of the restriction before we go into that um, uh, and let me let me do that here 
Why is that not allowing me to present these slides? No? Ah, okay. I have to configure the slideshow. Sorry for that. Takes me a minute to open that. It's just nicer to see the language because one of you uh, asked me in the break, okay, so can you explain to me what's the difference between uh, Vada log and what a data log? So give me the real, uh, give me the real foundation of this. So it makes sense to cover that right now so that all of the theorems after that also for them really purely theoretically minded people among you make sense. So we've seen this diagram here. Uh, 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 we, uh, we still need to expand it for shy. So uh, um, that's just to, to emphasize it again. This is also an important language in this area. And uh, what are the restrictions? Because what does it mean to become You've seen that the general language is undecidable. What does it mean to become decidable? Well, we need to make some restrictions. And we need to make some restrictions that still allow us to allow full data log recursion. And that's going to be a bit of a, a, a hassle because it's easy to actually remove full data log recursion in some ways. For example, some of you may know, may know guarded data log with existentials. And that's actually, well, it's it's working but you lose some of data log from it and that's a compromise we don't want to do think back about what seems like an eternity ago the examples were used full data log recursion so what's the restriction the five minute primer on that again if you want the details read the read, uh, read the papers that define them it's basically what the danger in in all of these settings and let me use my pointer here is of course when can we generate infinity whenever we generate things that's the existential quantifiers so how does that work so for example this rule here every employee is a manager produces a new existential the manager and there now we say well this this null here this newly created value by this rule will propagate to other rules that will have the same predicate in the head, namely every manager that is a person is again an employee. So there we have this dangerous propagation. So basically this is dangerous, basically building a loop here that generates a new value, right? So every employee is a manager and every manager is an employee. This is dangerous. This could create an infinite loop. That's why it's called dangerous in the definition. Uh, and what what the data log, the logical foundation of Vada log says is every dangerous variable should coexist in a single body atom called the world. So those of you who know guarded will see some kind of similarities and differences here. I won't now go into full details of that because otherwise everybody else gets uh, bored of it. Uh, but uh, the first restriction is the word must contain all of the dangerous variables in a single word. And the second is the word can share only harmless variables with the rest of the body. So those that don't contain any of those uh, the, 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 um, existential quantifiers. And these together are enough to guarantee basically the three properties that we've seen before, not constraining data log at all, allowing the full expressive power of Sparkle and R2QL. So if you want to see exactly how, if you want to think why this power is needed in the restrictions, you can very much think about what is required for data log, what is required for Sparkle and R2QL, and how do we keep tractability so for polynomial time. These are water dependencies and they have been, um, the, the original paper, and I hope I don't get it wrong, is by uh, Pierre Scottlop, was it, uh, um, I think that uh, Andrea Kali was in it and was uh, look at look, uh, and, uh, was Thomas Lukasiewicz only, okay, don't, uh, don't uh, put me on it. There's an original paper on water dependencies. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is that in that paper, basically uh, uh, the proof for P time completeness was an uh, alternating Turing machine proof, which of course, when practically implementing things, 
needs us to think a bit about okay how can we bring this to practice simulating an alternative turing machine probably will not be the right that the, the right approach and it's one of those rare cases where it's really critical in a team in a research team to have people who like both theory and practice because it needed a new theoretical analysis of it in particular the one that you will see here and it needed people who really like performance tuning and practical databases and reasoning work to make it work fast because you can even then make things fast so it's it's probably those of you who like both sides will have something where where it's really where you can strive and and, and thrive thrive is the right word for that so what is it so here you see a program that is what it uh, you could actually attack that uh, if you later see this slide or this recording and want to stop it, everything that is ahead on top is actually a variable that can contain existential, uh, exist so null, so the results of existential quantification. And what we are building inside of the system is basically these, these trees here. And uh, we'll talk about them here. They are basically uh, so-called a part of warded forests that allow you to see how nulls inside of such a uh, of such a execution of the chase tree derive. So for those of you who have never heard that the word chase and tree, the chase is a procedure to uh, actually execute rules by simply executing these if then rules. It's much more complex than that. And you can actually see the tree of things. So a company means there's some ownership. And you see that in that tree and you can draw the tree here and you can figure out certain structures of it. And that's critical for the theoretical analysis that can be brought into practice here. So we see this theoretical analysis here that shows us trees of and, and isolated trees of things happening inside of the chase. So here is the here you see the program here you see the input and here you see these parts of the chase tree. And the main thing we saw in the theoretical explanation here uh, is this special law of the ward. The ward wards things, and in particular, this goes into the theory because we can really build warded, uh, warded so-called warded forests that allow us to gain control of the shape of the chase tree, also from a theoretical perspective. Yes, so the question is, can this example be written in an equivalent plain data log? So this question always has, uh, has interesting answers because we know both of them are P time, right? So as long as we stay within P time, of course, we have certain guarantees of, uh, of, of, uh, of rewritability. So if we want a database dependent rewriting, for example, and, and uh, basically, uh, the theoreticians among you will know all of the, the, uh, the requirements of that, but to explain it plainly here, under a lot of assumptions, so if you allow database dependent rewrites and more along the theoretical guarantees, the, basically every single problem in p-time can be transferred into any other uh, uh, problem in p-time. And the answer to the, this is a, a really good question because especially those of you coming more from the practical side may not have heard that before, but you can always, within P time, you have this convertibility between problems. Now you're of course going to pay for it. In particular, sometimes you're going to pay for it in terms of uh, uh, having data dependent rewritings. Uh, and uh, 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 that's, that's one of those things that I think also we could at some point do a, do a bit of a a full talk on that during such a school. So figuring out uh, the basically rewriting is an important optimization procedure. So figuring out good balances between rewriting based and and chase based uh, type uh, 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 systems. Probably we are not going to get any uh, everything in there. But the short answer to this is it depends on. So first of all, everything in P time is intertransferable. Uh, and second uh, thing is that many things, of course, uh, uh, will, will then become, uh, uh, will then become, have certain restrictions to it, to say it plainly. If we had a bit more time, I could go into it because there are nice theorems there in, in the data log plus minus classes there. 
what uh, where you have finite chases where you have chases that, where you can define functions that bound the chase depth uh, so bounded derivation depth properties would be the pointers for those of you interested in uh, and i think that's what somehow bringing these kinds of things is mainly maybe the aim of bringing this to the foreground and uh, that's 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 really cool techniques that you can do there uh, um, more probably than we can handle here uh, uh, thanks for the question that's i think it's important to to uh, do that because somehow if you know we want to stay in p time we also at the back side of it get some kind of of guarantees so let me actually go to the first theorem there and that says take two facts in the watered forest this below here is the watered forest if the facts are isomorphic then the subtree is rooted in these facts are isomorphic and that's important for actually why is that important i told you before termination strategies uh, and this will be quite critical for termination strategies so for example if you have two facts here say ownership p1 of uh, uh, of hsb iba well they are not yet isomorphic because we see two different banks here but if these facts were isomorphic so if we could, would get a second time uh, 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 hsb and we actually get that look down here or we get a second time the fact company hsbc these are trivially isomorphic because they only contain constants we actually can cut off the chase and that's the that's now the trick that's the that's the whole trick and uh, one thing here you could do much simpler termination strategies than that it's just that these kind of termination strategies really perform well in in practice so the reason for this additional theoretical analysis is not because we need it from the alternating Turing machine proof we already know that it is p time and we know that certain rewriting uh, capabilities hold so all of the the, the the things you could do even before that but it's really figuring out what's the core of the thing that uh, that affects the performance of this fragment uh, and that's theory really that matters in practice and here you see uh, an example quite, quite hidden because you obviously stopped the chase here because you actually dealt with company HSBC before and in some cases even with nulls you can do that now those of you who know guarded and other fragments of course you can't do that that would put that, that uh, or in many cases you can't in there are fragments which allow have this property and fragments which don't so it's necessary to analyze them okay so that's that is it actually already doing the job you, you may think about it so if the, the tree under company hsbc must be isomorphic also the second time it is executed well it's not and the reason for that is that we talk about the warded forest which is actually a structure to be constructed after all and not the chase tree uh, the chase graph the chase graph is the actual thing that gets executed and any property that we need needs to be out about the chase graph otherwise we don't get any theoretical guarantees there and the second theorem there is well again we are not going into the detail in that but uh, if you look at two facts in the chase graph of a set of harmless worded rules so a particular type of rules where we need to do some rewriting before and there comes a bit of the question before from what's the role between rewriting and so on it's actually that we make this compromise here saying we have a theorem that basically guarantees us relatively good performance when in practice but we need first harmless worded rules but there is another property that says any worded rules can be transformed into these special harmless worded sets and there's also where the question comes in we can make a bit of a compromise on how much we do by rewriting how much we can do by execution and that hopefully makes some of those of you are really interested in that part of of things quite like ah okay cool i can uh, do a bit of theory a little bit of practice a bit of balance between different techniques it's, it's fun to work in these kind of spaces but then you actually have the property on the chase graph and then you can actually cut off the chase at that point with the guarantee of not losing any tuples is it necessary from a theoretical point of view no the alternating Turing machines are enough is it helpful in the practical view to achieve performance yes 
And the third one, and that's the last one I will give you here before basically uh, uh, making sure we go into a, a few of the last extension before wrapping up and giving you time for questions is, uh, is, is making this actually work in practice. Because think back about our practical system, the termination strategies need to actually be aware of all of this information. So there's a, uh, there's a, a there's a um, trade-off here. The more of these structures we store, because we have isomorphic things in our caches in the system, the earlier we can terminate the chase. There are some minimal ones that we need to store, but basically, if we find such an isomorphic thing, we can immediately stop. And that's something to guarantee termination, but actually also to optimize execution, which means the best thing would actually be to store basically everything we see, we store in memory. And you can see where this ends. This ends with basically at some point, say you do this in one terabyte or one petabyte of data. How are we going to guarantee performance on one petabyte of data if even our backend storage allows that? Well, that's going to be hard. How? Uh, because you see here, we have still constants in these trees. And if you have a billion, a trillion constants in there, you're going to overwhelm any main memory of any system. So to make sure that such a system, when we translate it into practice, and that's, that's why these theorems are there, uh, are there, we need to make sure that even if it's a one, with one petabyte of data, of course, in the right subfragments where this is possible, uh, do the, uh, uh, have some guarantees. And uh, that's the last proposition that I want to show you. And that's if we actually do a bit of more fine grained uh, uh, um, analysis of that and construction of a, a thing called a linear forest. So let A and B be two facts in a linear forest. If they have a certain degree of isomorphism, it's now a more specialized isomorphism because we need to be more fine grained, then the subtrees are pattern isomorphic. And that's the real thing that we then store in most cases in our, in our caches in the system because they, 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 there are only much fewer of them because they don't contain constants. That means, of course, at runtime, the system has to do a bit more work, this pattern isomorphism. But it's this trade-off between space and, uh, and time. We usually don't have enough space to uh, store even the patterns of all constants. So we need to make sure that we have it fully lifted, you could say. So uh, in, in some ways, not having any constants at all. And this is not here to explain you these, these, these propositions. That's, uh, my, my goal here was kind of give you this feeling of how, what the, how does, does uh, 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 research that brings theory into practice in this, uh, in this space uh, uh, lead? And why you need people who actually can do uh, uh, in, uh, uh, hardcore theory? Because actually finding such things like watered forests and new types of isomorphism and actually making sure that uh, all of this is absolutely correct, that's something where really theoreticians can shine. But finding out what the right things are and then implementing them so that they are super fast with low overhead in practice, that's going to take somebody who really likes optimization of caches and caring about whether that join actually behaves like this join or that join. Enough said about that. I think you get a bit of a picture on that. And hopefully this bit deep dive helped you go into it. Now, the really interesting case is, of course, how all of this works with all of the other extensions. So we talked about the machine learning extensions before. So, for example, let me go back to an example there before from uh, that we looked at before that uh, that uh, uh, I'm, again, I'm not since this is recorded, I'm not mentioning the names of people who are asking questions in case you are not wanting your names be put at the uh, at the big table. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the question asked before, how does this look at uh, if you are looking into uh, actually executing this inside of, uh, where is it? To that slide and let me 
go active on this one here. Again, many slide decks. So if you're remembering back this system, you must uh, must be aware of that you're in a setting where you basically have all of the other features as well. So basically some are external predicates like uh, uh, having the, the, uh, the KGE model there. Uh, you have some kind of, of numerics and in this case, I don't think we have uh, aggregation in, in there. Uh, and so you have negation, you have aggregation, uh, you have a lot of things and, uh, and, and external predicates uh, like machine learning based predicates. It's not going to be super easy now to keep track of all uh, of, of these and still guarantee super uh, have absolute guarantees and guarantee a good performance. That's that's one of the challenges. And uh, I mean, it clearly also, if you think back about the other uh, site that we looked at, namely uh, uh, looking at uh, the and let's close this for a moment and go into the injection part of it that we started with. It's, it's a really interesting challenge because uh, once we, uh, two things, uh, there are interesting ways of using knowledge graph embeddings actually to speed up the chase. So this is not a one-way street. There is uh, uh, one paper we worked on with, with uh, some of uh, uh, and as, a, as a relatively large collaboration also with the Central Bank of Italy on using knowledge graph embeddings during the chase to speed it up. So using things that both keep absolute guarantees while using embeddings to approximate some of those, uh, those um, uh, so using some of those embeddings that we see, not simply, but other types of embeddings to actually make parts of this isomorphizing check uh, uh, faster, sometimes guaranteeing absolute uh, uh, termination, sometimes actually uh, making this a bit more uh, prob uh, probabilistically guaranteed that uh, uh, actually uncertain in some ways, probabilistic would be too much to say in this case, uh, to, uh, to, to guarantee some properties. But you can you actually use some of those embeddings as parts of termination strategies that we've seen before, which is one of those interactions, one of the questions went in before, but the other more, the, the, the other very challenging question is all of us start working, of course, on actually the other way around. So looking at, um, if we, if we look at the, 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 these two directions of, uh, of looking at logical reasoning and machine learning. So these grand neurosymbolic challenges that we are talking about all of the time. Thinking about in this direction, it seems to be quite that there are there, there quite many challenges because in the other direction, we've seen, for example, using knowledge graph embeddings for better termination strategies for logical reasoning and so on. There are certain interesting ways, and it, it's there, there's a lot of research going on there, of course, but we have it a bit more under control because many of us are more accustomed to the logical side of it. Now, the real interesting question is how do we preserve some of the guarantees that we have in logical reasoning once we inject it in knowledge graph embeddings or graph neural networks? And that's what many of us are working on at the moment. Again, I can give you all of the pointers to papers on that. I didn't plan to cover it in this lecture, so that's why you don't have the pointers right now, but both for, the, for this direction, so using uh, knowledge graph embeddings for speeding up uh, uh, logical reasoning, we have a paper on that, and uh, and on logical knowledge uh, in graph in, in knowledge graph embeddings, we have a paper on that, and I give, will give you all of the the pointers on that. So in each of them, we could go deeper. Okay, and I mean I didn't uh, I didn't put any of the buzzwords there, especially because you have got more so much more deep uh, deep uh, 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 dives into some of those topics during the week. So I want to scratch them because one of the themes of this week is, of course, seeing how probabilistic reasoning, how statistical uh, relational uh, learning, how many of those techniques come into our space. So I hope I gave you enough of pointers there 
uh, to, to show you basically half of the extensions are in this direction, but also not to bore you to death with repeating what you heard five times already during other presentations. But I guess this, in some ways, the question that was raised at the break was good because uh, it's good to see that the, that the pieces that are that we don't go into deep detail in there and where you can deep dive into. And I will give you all of the all of the pointers and paper pointers in that, including the express EFE uh, uh, knowledge graph embedding techniques that allows you basically to embed all far a greater deal of data log than you have seen in, in any of the other languages, which many of the people don't care too much in the, in the, yet in this world, uh, because they're not, not so much aware of, they, they know what symmetry is, but they don't necessarily know what an application like anti-money laundering is, for which we need full recursion. And injecting the anti-money laundering regulation into a machine learning model is something that is, is really cool to do, and can be done with people like many of you who know logic-based reasoning quite well and who know machine learning quite well and knowledge graph embeddings. And uh, yeah, we, we could talk about that forever. Now, let me actually get to the last topic in there that I want to at least tease you on because it's a critical extension in our, in our uh, area and that's temporal knowledge graph. So again, we can't here go into all of the details, but one thing that such weeks like and such lectures that you see here is really, they hopefully raise some kind of, they're not, not usually telling you the whole picture, but make, make one aware of things going on where it may be reasonable to do some interesting research on. And that's why, why I'm raising the, the, uh, the, the temporal knowledge graph area here and temporal reasoning especially because there's currently a bit of a thrive of the area going on at Theovin, at Oxford, quite a, a group, a, a big, a big, a, a big a, um, a, yeah, drive there. Again, I'm not going to name names here without asking people, but there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people working in this area and it's, it's really fun. So uh, just to give you a bit of a teaser, why time is such a, a difficult beast in data log is it first starts with representations of time. So first thing, time is infinite, which makes it quite hard. Even if you have discrete time, what is discrete time using uh, integers uh, for it? Now, in temporal databases and things like data log 1s, which is one of the classical approaches to it, uh, this is usually the thing that is uh, the, uh, quite often applied, of course, not always, you know, temporal databases, of course, that use different methodologies, but it's this setting. In dense time, and there we will look at a language called data log MTL a bit, and uh, butter log with temporal reasoning, uh, uh, we, uh, you can always go into, you can zoom in deeper. You have dense time, so you have, for example, uh, the rational numbers as a as a kind of allegory of it. Like in, uh, man, it's a good discussion whether in reality we can subdivide times uh, infinitely because at some point we will hit physical boundaries. But uh, uh, from a pure performance perspective, you can think about uh, that you've, if you measure everything in the smallest possible physical type of time, that's going to be inefficient quite soon. And uh, another thing is continuous time, so the real numbers. So I'm not going into temporal databases here. That would be a whole talk of its own. Um, but the one thing that makes a bit of sense to look at is actually at least to, to look into um, graph databases a bit and to see the kind of things we have there, which are node to edges, version graphs, time tree models, snapshots, and so on, and that we at least put these topics uh, uh, here, the one that we are going to talk about here, and that's what I'm going to show you here to give you a teaser of, of what's going on here, and then we are going to go to the questions, is not data log M1S, where it's basically you handling 
the time yourself if the system allows some kind of uh, arithmetic. Again, you see the danger of that, right? Arithmetic means uh, potential undecidability. Time is infinite. So you need ways of making that uh, work. The one thing I want to give you a brief teaser is uh, data log MTL and Vado log with temporal reasoning there, where it's basically uh, using temporal uh, logic operators like this one here, box and diamond, in this case going into the past, box minus and diamond minus with intervals. So basically saying, for example, you flag any, you, well, that was not what I wanted. Uh, screen, unblack screen, I wanted my pointer. Flag anything that you're monitoring and where there was a signal within the last five time, uh, within the far last three time units that lasted for at least five time units. So basically if the fire alarm goes off for more than five minutes, probably call the fire department, something like that. Uh, but uh, I'm not going into the deep details into that. I just wanted to, you to see it for a minute. And that's one of the extensions. So let's, let's wrap it up here a bit and, and see what we've seen so far and what we are at. So if you look loading my my wrap up slides here with my cursor being hidden because that's what the what the pointer likes to do let's take an, a typical example like hostile takeovers or some application scenario some business application that we have and by the way here are some pointers to that where you can really if you want to take a look of that i invite you to actually uh, uh, follow some of those things because it's there uh, in some things that I mentioned for a few minutes there are huge uh, there, uh, there, there are huge uh, uh, things in the background for that that we could spend uh, hours on so for example just looking at the browser here uh, you could see how this actually works in a in the real world uh, so I invite you to actually look into some of those things deeper but the key thing here is that you see data log, and in particular data log with existentials. Uh, uh, I, I think in this example, I don't show you that many existentials, but they are super, super critical for analyzing parts of the knowledge graph that you don't know. We need all of those extensions, like arithmetics, like machine learning. If you want to know whether two uh, uh, companies are colluding somehow, so working together, most often you need machine learning to do that. Uh, and you, you see all of the extensions coming together, like aggregation, like machine learning, like temporal reasoning. We have, not in this call now, but in, in, in some others, sometimes you have a person who basically works uh, purely on making sure the temporal integration works well. Uh, and you can go in all kinds of directions and you need all of those applications legal frameworks. I think at Rule ML we have a purely legal, also a, a something uh, focusing on legal parts of it. You're going to need a temporal reasoning, you need to know the aggregate reasoning, and you need good performance in practice and you need to theoretical guarantees. That's a fascinating field I think we are in to, to do research on, both in terms of pure, really machine learning focused things and as I said, we have people working purely on how to inject this thing and make sure that machine learning models do the right things or to speed up logic-based reasoning and do it in applications where you can demonstrate practical success. That's fascinating and I hope you've gotten a bit, a few either uh, motivation or ideas or interesting avenues to do that. And I'm happy, of course, for you to ask any question on it or contact on that or ask for paper pointers, ask where, how, how one could do more in one area. That's, that's really one of the things that I uh, want to, want to uh, finish this with. And we have 15 minutes for questions. And let me put on during that time, uh, this particular slide that could give some inspiration for questions in this symbolic, sub-symbolic world that we are living in, which is uh, this one here, which gives you the big picture of 
what you have seen partially and not partially. By the way, the the uh, the the these blogs are not necessarily to hide something from you, but since this is a public recorded presentation that we are likely going to put very publicly, I cannot, of course, put everything there that we could put into a into a semi public uh, venue there. So uh, that's the one page. And with this, I'm very happy for your questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Thank you very much uh, for the talk. Uh, I'm not sure if um, if there are any questions at this stage. Um, I can I can start with with one question. Uh, so you showed a very nice complexity map um, at the, in the first part of your talk, and I, I noticed that there is this gap. So you you are either in P, or then it's exponential time. Yes. Uh, but what, isn't there? Anything is there anything in between, and if not, why not? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm uh, I'm not aware. I mean, the data log plus minus field or existential rule field tried to do quite a lot of things in this area. And let me try to get the diagram up for you so that you s all people see it. Again, advantages and disadvantages of having a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, different slides here. Ah, I have it. Uh, that's the slide so that everybody has it as for reference. That's the slide we are talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, there's the, that's the slide. Uh, and yeah, there, there is this gap, that's true. Um, the, the the thing is, uh, in somehow it's a, in in some ways there's a personal answer to this and a more more broad answer to this. So uh, first, from the philosophy, coming a bit from the the performance and database uh, side of it, we set kind of p timers are absolute upper boundary for most cases. So our search was mostly for p time and below. So always making sure that we constrain the real world needed features so far that we can get, get p time guarantees but many of the extension if you use them in an unrestricted way of course go beyond that and i think you raise an interesting point namely it would be fascinating to have theoretical guarantees about some of the extensions that are not so restricted that we basically push them down again to p time uh, in i mean in many of those cases you yeah you you go far beyond it. For example, for temporal reasoning, there are cases where, where where using some of those extensions you can go far beyond that. But I think what you raise is very interesting. Namely, this question: the area that we are concentrating on is mostly p time and below. For example, one of our uh, big pushes was analog space fragments because we want uh, a, a lot of parallelizability, both both in terms of distribution and in terms of multi-core parallelization. But uh, and and n log space and below will help us at least get fragments that have theoretical potential for that. But we personally didn't uh, uh, look too much between p time and x time. And you're fully right; that would be extremely interesting to to look at. Maybe some of in the audience who uh, does some more research on the top end, uh, so above p time, can also say something about that. that but that's my. That's my first answer. There's really not that much uh, between that, as I know. But again, I may have overlooked uh, uh, something. So it's not a not meant as uh, as anything between that. Uh, shy is also p time, by the way. Well, thank you. There is a question by uh, Leopoldo. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, I have two questions. One is more technical. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully can be something can be said. Is uh, for example, you, in the temporal context, uh, could you, for example, uh, take advantage or enforce? I mean, dynamic constraints, like for example, a salary of an employee never decreases, something like that. For example, yeah. you could use it for semantic word optimization, or you could try to enforce that. I mean, I don't know. Is, is there anything that you can say about that? Because Constraints is a different thing, right? Yeah, and force is any. Uh, the, the the point is extremely interesting because in many cases for for um, 
for uh, and that goes to the query side not the constraint side so it's a bit of a, a slight deviation from the question before i go to the core of it is we actually need monotonicity for guaranteeing a lot of uh, performance or even decidability so there's a reason why you why uh, many slides back we saw monotonic sum in some cases because basically there are many recursion if you have non-monotonic sum there's absolutely no uh, termination guarantee for that so if you do manitonic maximum of something uh, and and under certain constraints or manitonic sum or whatever you you have far more situation in which you can guarantee decidability and complexity guarantees then in that actually that this is a huge point of interesting research because not a lot of strong guarantees are given in this area uh, we had some master thesis that that partially explore these things but it's far from clear what kind of uh, guarantees we get for something and the monotonic restriction is actually something that is often needed uh, for making reasoning have any kind of good uh, 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 good um, pro, um, good good uh, guarantees uh, and uh, the, the point you raised Leo is actually quite interesting in terms of okay now we can actually recognize such trends and we need that so mono recognizing monotonic trends is one of the three types of extensions that that uh, that we put into the system because people in temporal uh, systems really need that there are some systems that can do basically uh, recognizing fixed length uh, uh, things fixed length uh, trends there are things that uh, that have dynamic length recognition and then there is this temporal trend recognition of monotonic increase or monotonic decrease and so on of that and we put it in as one of the one of the extensions that are needed but so far there are there are some theoretical guarantees for that but not that many are available for it and it's so important in the application scenarios that we looked at especially at the beginning so i could have named a lot of them in in the financial space monotonic guarantees and trends are super important uh, if you look in the trading space when do the monotonic trend actually go in the other direction now suddenly we need to uh, uh, do something in terms of regulation we need to check whether there was some market manipulation in a certain sense or not uh, and and things like that so all of this is super important and if you know before it is a constraint uh, that something is this uh, that is the case i mean first of all we can we get a theoretical guarantee if you know from the data that this monotonic trend is guaranteed in some ways and if you know it from before that it, it should raise it it, uh, it would really be fascinating to see some of those cases to talk about it further because uh, it could raise a lot of different uh, questions both in terms of guarantees in terms of optimization in the engines uh, and 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 so on so uh, it, it, uh, monotonicity is a super interesting feel in this uh, super interesting direction in it and i haven't i haven't at all uh, uh, put a lot of focus on it in this talk because we could talk uh, forever on it but if you look at at the monotonicity as 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 done in in uh, in, uh, in 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 the in, in saniola et al papers and the uh, work by suchu and and reinhardt and and uh, the relational ai teams and so on about the about the um, about the uh, uh, semi rings that they used in that case, and what uh, what is really at the core of the Vadalog system, this monotonicity handling of things. I think there are cool things to work on. Of course, in the work that you did, Leo, in, the, in this area, not to <laughs> not to put it. Uh, now I use the name. Sorry for that in the recording. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Well, I do have another question, but I don't want to monopolize the microphone. <laughs> uh, please, Leo, go ahead. Yes, I, there are no more questions as far as I know. Please go ahead. Okay, well, uh, it is a very high level question, but uh, I have been thinking about that all the time. Uh, um, so you have uh, created a very nice uh, system, right, on top of a uh, word data log. Uh, so my question is, uh, have you de developed some sort of feeling uh, about uh, for when and under what condition or for what scenarios more the data log is going to be expressive enough to to to, to for producing a model right yes. or the other, the other way around i put it in a different way 
have you encountered situations that are quite natural from the, for example, business point of view, financial point of view, where all the data log has not been expressive enough? I don't know. Yeah. Any thoughts on that would be very interesting for me at least. Yeah. So I can give the canonical answer then and an open answer afterward. So uh, the canonical answer to it is uh, we both looked through uh, the, a lot of available benchmarks out there uh, that are seen partially based on real world, partially based on on, uh, on, on, on synthetic data. Uh, and uh, pretty much, uh, uh, let me, let me th so that I'm not stating something wrong on the record, but my memory is that all of the benchmarks that we looked at are, are awarded. Uh, and in particular, and that's very interesting in this uh, even more paralyzable fragments, a good percentage of them are actually uh, uh, this fragment that guarantees this theoretical parallelizability so that that are uh, that are um, that are uh, that have this kind of linearity property there uh, but and the second evidence is that looking at basically together with the central bank of italy and other partners we've now basically worked on and and, and if you look at boeing and and uh, and uh, the other partners that we looked at uh, 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 um, BMW and the others. We looked at a lot of things, and so far, basically, all of the things could stay at least from the theoretically fragment in, uh, in, in warded. Sometimes, requiring, of course, extensions in terms of things like these. These, uh, so for example, this importance of monotonic aggregation was absolutely clear from the beginning through the. The direct collaboration with the Central Bank of Italy on many of those things and some others like the machine learning extensions once, but to to now make it, this was the canonical answer, but to give a more open answer, as usual, the question where it's not enough is actually the most interesting ones. So we it would really be interesting to see cases where it's not enough because uh, that allows us to expand things. And one thing we are currently trying to do together with uh, the team at Calabria is actually bringing Warden and Shai together. And we are trying to explore use cases where you need the power of both Warden and Shai. And it's, it's something where it, it's really interesting to investigate. We are working on it, but it, it's, it's something that would, it's, it's always more interesting what you can do than what you can do. Uh, so all of these talks where the guy in front says, ah, well, we can do everything and anything and just give it to us. These are the most boring talks ever. It's more interesting what we can't do. And the other, actually, the really interesting thing that is also in it is things that are in this paralyzable fragment of Vatalog, but not in full Vatalog. How can we optimize them? Uh, but in full Vatalog, but not paralyzable. In this subfragment, how can we optimize them? But yeah. Question is fun, but I'm stopping here because I think we got, we got, uh, um, yeah. So, uh, um, uh, I think we, sh we, we, sh we have to wrap up. We are over, over time. So, ah. now, uh, uh, I think so, unless I think, yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for the nice presentation and for answering all the questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me thank you for all of your patience on all of your questions and staying with me. I know how hard it is to watch for two and a half hours a person talking. And uh, it, uh, thank you really much for uh, thank you for, for for speaking uh, uh, with that. Uh, it's hard to stare at boxes for two hours, but it's also hard to do that. Perfect. Let me okay, share uh, the uh, screen. Go, we, yeah, there is another question. I'm not sure if yeah. <laughs> and it's one that I can very easily. I think that the, the event can already officially finish the, the, for the lecture, but still, if you have a bit more time, I'm really curious about some yes. of the effects. And that's, uh, I can answer that, uh, especially I can. Answer